If I ask my heart and conscience, the incentive behind building a tower, I have to admit it was just pure megalomania. All creative people work from their subconscious outwards. I'm not an intellectual at all. In fact, most intellectuals resent me. They all realize I'm not one of them and are quite nasty. To them, I'm sort of an overgrown child. And I always try and, now that I'm old, saying I'm in my second childhood, you must excuse me. But of course, that's not strictly true because I've never grown out of my first childhood. His godfather was Edward VII, King of England, a frequent guest at West Dean for the weekend hunting parties. It was rumored that the king was young Edward's real father, a story that Edward typically refuted with a story of his own. You see, the king was constantly here, and naturally gossip went around that he was my mother's lover. Well, I know that is completely untrue. The king knew that my mother was his daughter, and therefore, where any bastard blood came in, it wasn't in that generation, it was in my grandmother's generation. I think if the truth had been told and been admitted that she was the daughter of, of Edward VII and not the mistress, it would have been made much more sense, much more wholesome. I remember being brought down ceremoniously to say good night to her. Uh, she wasn't like an ordinary mother who put you to bed or fed you or things. My nurse was my real mother. My nurse was warm and comfy and soft. And my mother had very, very tight whalebone corsets, looked very beautiful, was covered with jewels, it seemed, all the time. She had things on top of things, which was the Edwardian fashion. She would have sables with double palmer violets pinned on them. And the sables had horrid little heads that that showed they'd once been live animals. My mother was so distant from my children. There's a story about her which is probably apocryphal, but it sums up the attitude. She was heard calling up the main staircase one day, Nanny, Nanny, I want one of the children to take to church. And uh, my nurse replied, Which one, madam? She said, The one that goes best with my blue dress. If I'm a surrealist, it's not because I got linked with a movement, it's because I was born one. A great number of people are surrealists without ever having heard of the movement. But it is people who were close to their subconscious. The world is not completely logical all the time. They make the illogical logical, and they make it uh, more vivid than life, in the way that dreams can sometimes be more vivid than actuality. When I was a child, I used to have the most extraordinary surrealist fantasies. I think one of the reasons that my fantasy was developed so intensely was that I was forced to rest, quite unnecessary, when I should have been allowed to run around in the garden. I was made to sleep in my perambulator, and I couldn't sleep. Also, I wasn't allowed up in the morning. I remember in Scotland, in a wonderful fine day in August, and the sun pouring through the blinds at seven, I wanted to get out of my little bed, which I was hemmed in by big brass rails, and run out into the garden and down to the beach. But I wasn't allowed to until Nanny woke up, which wasn't until 8.30. So I would have from seven till 8.30, in which I'd have to invent the world. And therefore, all my blankets became a, a flying city, and I made domes out of the pillows, and I would get under and imagine that I was in a series of halls, and this was Aladdin's palace flying over the world. Edward was obsessed with uh, Tilly Lush, and he said that on their marriage night, he naturally wanted to consummate their marriage. And she quite laughed at him and said, I mean, you don't think that I married you to have this kind of a relationship with you, do you? I mean, you couldn't have been thinking that. And she refused to have a, a, a sexual relationship with him. I remember Lady Cunard saying to me when I was 16 at a tea party. She asked me some question, where is so-and-so? So I told her where so-and-so was and how he was. And evidently I should have answered the question truthfully. So she said to me, she had a very funny voice, Lady Cunard. She talked like this. She said, Edward, the trouble about you is you will go around telling the truth. Now society is built upon a lie. 
And if you go around telling the truth the way you do, you won't be received in decent houses. So I thought very profound. Ostracized by his social set after his divorce, Edward retreated to his childhood home at West Dean. I uh, was very broken with grief after my wife left me, and also the exhaustion of the ballet, and a great loss of money too. So I came back to this house alone, and the spring was so glorious at West Dean. This house was so full of treasures. And the whole place was so rich with everything beautiful in creation, that as I was beginning my dinner, I suddenly saw the room begin to spin. I looked up at the ceiling and I saw, I knew it was a projection of my own subconscious, but I saw a circle of all creation with a great light in the middle and all the flowers and trees according to their genuses spread out and all the animals according to their races and families all around, around this central light. And then it began to turn slowly and then faster and faster and I heard the music of the last movement of Beethoven's Eroica Symphony going faster and faster and faster till suddenly it exploded in the sky. Edward turned his rejection by proper society into a source of inspiration. He outraged his fox hunting neighbors by converting his father's hunting lodge, known as Moncton, into a whimsical, surrealist showcase. Traditionalists were shocked by the lavender exteriors, fiberglass palm trees, mock bamboo drain pipes, plaster sheets permanently drying in the windows, and a chimney clock that counted the days of the week. Completed in 1937, Moncton was a seedbed for ideas that Edward would later realize at Las Posas. Edward even had the paw prints of his beloved wolfhounds woven into the carpet, a motif he had used at West Dean with Tilly's footprints, and would later repeat at Las Posas in concrete. Moncton became a home for the surrealist art Edward was now beginning to collect in earnest, which included a couch inspired by a dolly painting in the shape of Mae West's lips. I always thought Edward was barking mad, and that was due to the peculiar things he was always doing, inviting Dolly to come and live with him, for example. Um. He had an obsession about tissue paper. He traveled with 5,000 layers or rolls or packages of tissue paper. I thought he was quite simply crazy at the beginning. I thought, but he, uh, it wasn't that way at all. He was not crazy. He was indeed eccentric. He did have certain hang-ups and things he did. I began to notice early on that he had to go to the into the bathroom a lot and what he did was he washed his hands a lot he was constantly washing his hands and I counted up one day I think it got to be 28 times in the late morning and early afternoon I've never wanted to be an eccentric in fact I've tried to conform as much as possible but something in my nature obliges me to be eccentric and it's People think, oh, he's a posing. He, he wants to make himself interesting. He's posing as eccentric. It's quite untrue. Uh, one is an eccentric, in this case, entirely against one's own will, one's own planning. It's just something that was born with, like having green hair. In fact, there was, a, I think, a movie about it called The Boy with the Green Hair, showing that he couldn't help having green hair. I met Edwards, and Nelly introduced me to him. And of course, he was very interesting. I asked him, I'd like to work for you. He said, well, I, I, you have to come to me and we're going to talk, discuss all what I want from you. 
So I said, fine. So next day I went to him and went to dinner. And he said, I like this thing. And first thing, I hate my secretary who want to work for me had to be on the nude. Do you mind? This is my first condition. If you mind, then I don't think so we can get along very well if you don't want to wear in the nude. So I said, well, it's okay. Being in Mexico, going in the river, I take my clothes off and I swim, so what difference it makes to me? We start typing, type and type, repeat them many times. And then, if I was typing a lot of paper and something fall on the floor, he, we had to throw it away. Because he was said, germ, I don't want anything to fall on the floor. Everything is dirty, so let's try to destroy this thing. Let's burn it on the toilet. And so he'd go to the toilet and burn every paper on the toilet. And they said, and give me more paper. Now I start all over again. Maybe one point, we start maybe 20 times, typing over and over and over. As a surrealist, Edward felt that art should compete with reality. His first glimpse of the Watts Towers in Los Angeles moved him deeply. Here was a magnificent surrealist creation on a scale beyond anything he had imagined, and the city was threatening to destroy it. The Watts Towers are the work of an Italian-American craftsman named Simon Rodia. He pieced them together out of concrete in bits of scavenged glass and tile. It took him 30 years. But Rodia had neglected to secure the proper building permits. And city officials condemned the towers as unsafe and irrational. Edward joined the rescue effort that saved them from the wrecking ball. For Edward, the Watts Towers were a revelation, something so big and so grand that it literally transformed reality. He saw a new way of realizing his own artistic ambitions.